Um, as soon as we get some slides, survey says. Oh, sweet. Okay. Um, so this talk is titled A J Rubius Journey to Go. Uh, I'm Mike Gayhart, Twitter handle. I work for a company called Pivotal. Um, so those of you who have heard of Pivotal Labs, we were acquired X number of years ago, spun out into a new company called Pivotal. Can use confuse the crap out of everybody, including all of us that work for the company. Um, and one of our big products is Cloud Foundry. So if anybody's heard of Heroku, this is kind of Heroku that you can run on your own servers, which is kind of fun. Um, I've been working on this team off and on for the past two years, a year and a half, two years. Um, and this is a story of my journey from Ruby to Go. So back in the day, I actually got a bachelor's in chemical engineering uh, in 1995. So Gabriel was talking about programming on floppy disks and cassette tapes. My first computer was a Commodore 64. I used to punch the extra hole on the single-sided disk. Dave's like, yeah, to get double-sided disks and not pay for them, which I always found was funny. So yeah, I got a bachelor's in chemical engineering. Um, and then I got into programming. And I actually started programming in the evil language of Java, which is not so bad if you've used Java 8. I'm actually writing Java now. It's not, not horrible. It's not great, but it's not horrible. Um, I've written PHP in production. I've written Ruby in production, and that picture looks really weird up here. Um, this was my primary language before switching to Go. So that I actually taught a 24-week developer training program teaching people how to write Ruby and Rails. So as someone was saying, Francesca was saying, like there's this expert level. I was an expert at Ruby. Like this was my language. And the list goes on. I think I once counted, I've written 10 languages in production. So you're writing code since 1998, you're gonna write some stuff. I've even written Haskell, not in production. This is stuff something I do on my spare time. Um, this stuff is mind bending to me. Um, Monads, yeah, I still don't understand them. I think I've read every blog post on the internet about monads. I'm like, what's a functor again? A monoid? Um, but it's been really interesting, and it's, this is what I do. Um, so how I got started in Go, I was actually sitting at Scala, Scala Days in New York City probably two years ago, um, and I sent back this blog post to the company about, wow, Scala is awesome, we should use Scala in production. And um, Rob Mee, who was then our CEO, was like, hey, I want you to look at this language called Go. I'm like, mm, okay. So I walked back into the office after Scala Day, super stoked to write another JVM-based language, and he handed me this project. He's like, we have this CLI in Ruby. We want to switch it to Go. I had not written one line of Go except for, like, the Go tour. Thank you. Uh, and I sat down, and I was like, uh, okay, um, so let's do this. I haven't written a C or C, a C based language in 1998. So very, very like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, yeah, and then I got to play with Go. And it was very new to me. Um, so the one thing I've learned in all the languages is that syntax is easy. Learning the words of a language is relatively easy. What is hard are the idioms. How is the language put together and things like that. Um, has anybody seen Ruby code that's written like Java, or Java written like Ruby, or pick a language written like some other language that that person used to program in? That's where it gets tricky. So I'm going to give you some tips that I've used to get myself from Ruby into Go. Use the, your mileage is going to vary on these. They're some pretty strong opinions. Um, I look forward to discussing them more with you all and learning. Um, so the first tip is learn the vocabulary. These are the words that make up the language. So it's the syntax of the language. Um, this is a great resource to get started. Just go through the tour. Just get a picture of what it looks like, what the language looks like, how the formatting looks. It's going to look different than your Ruby. It's going to look different than Java. It's going to look different than Haskell. Um, another great one is the spec. I think the spec is what, 50 pages, gentlemen? I mean. Not very long. You can read this in an afternoon. Um, and it's really good, um, which really shocked me about, about Go. Coming from Ruby, I mean, good God, that language is complex. There is no spec-ish. Um, so read the specification. And you might not understand it all. 
You might read it six or seven times over your career, but just start there and just figure out what the language looks like. You now know how to say yellow and go, and you know how to say house and go. You have the basic building blocks of what the language looks like. You can now consume go. So there's a difference. How many people uh, can read, well, you all speak English. How many of you produce very good English? You probably all produce. This, this is where talking to a foreign, a foreign crowd throws all my like idioms off. So I can consume Spanish much better than I can produce Spanish. So I was in Barcelona last fall, um, and I could actually find my way around Barcelona, but good luck talking in Spanish. So where you're at now is you can now consume. You can read. You can look through source code. You can start to consume this stuff. It's a lot harder to produce at this point. So you want to get yourself comfortable consuming. Um, so what is an idiom? Anybody know what an idiom is? It's a special feature, a special phrasing, or a peculiarity. So Go's got some peculiarities, not going to lie. It's a lot different than Ruby. Um, so you need to understand this stuff. And this is what's going to get you to be able to talk to other people. As you write code, communicating in code, these idioms are what's going to allow you to communicate effectively. If you, you're not idiomatic code, it's not going to be effective. I think Gabriel showed some code where you're like, oh, that's not idiomatic go. What is it doing? Um, this is the one idiom that gets me all the time. So I think this is right. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Wikipedia says this, so it must be correct. Um, so in English, I do subject, verb, object. And I'm thinking in Hindi, I do subject, object, verb, according to Wikipedia. So if I'm, like, I'm not, I don't think my wife is in the room. But if I were talking to my wife, I would say, I love her. But in Hindi, I say, I, her, love. Spanish is the same way. The adjectives go in front of the verbs. Is that true? OK, sweet. I'm not making stuff up. It's always good. Um, but if I were to structure my sentences in Hindi like I structured them in English, you'd look at them and you're like, well, I guess that works. But there's, a, there's something that's off there. And it allowed the barrier to communication. Um, so I have a hypothesis. You are more than welcome to disagree and or argue with me. That writing idiomatic code makes using the language easier. But if you know what the idioms look like, you can produce code a lot more effectively. And it allows others to more easily understand your code. So Gabriel was talking about the future you. Um, when I look at my old Go, old Go code, I'm like, who wrote this stuff? And then you do a Git blame, and you're like, oh, I did, like a year and a half ago. Um, so this is super important. The first thing you have to do is forget the old idioms. So if you're writing Ruby, we learned this the hard way. Um, the first project I worked on, we wrote a bunch of Go code that looked like Ruby code. And we're like, oh, dear god, this just doesn't work. You have to forget all of them. So start with a clean slate, which is really nice. You don't have to remember how this stuff works because you don't even know how it works. So forget all of that stuff and learn the new stuff. Um, the big one for me, and that's really hard to read, is, is Go an object-oriented language. So coming from Ruby, everything is an object in Ruby. Everything in Java is an object. PHP, the jury is still out on whether everything's an object. Um, my favorite answer to this is yes and no. It's like, well, yeah, and no. So at that point, you're like, well, I might as well just forget everything I know about object-oriented programming and learn, it, learn what Go does. Um, the type hierarchy, I love the lightweight type hierarchy in Go. So that's one of my favorite concepts in the language is the fact that the type hierarchy is really light. And we use that. And if you fight against it, you're going to do nothing, do nothing, do nothing but cause pain. Um, so it's definitely different than Ruby. A great article by Nathan Youngman um, that explains how it's different. And I highly recommend going into that. It's a really good, um, a really good description of that. Um, composition over inheritance. You have no inheritance hierarchy in Go. If you try to build one, you are going to be very, very distraught. Um, how many people use composition now in their Ruby code? Yeah, this, this guy's like, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I thought I did. Nobody does, because we're all taught that a car is a type of vehicle in school when you learn. We're taught inheritance from day one in object-oriented programming. And go, you don't get that. You get composition. 
So here in Go, two interfaces, I have a reader and a closer. What do I do if I want both? I compose them. I reuse the interfaces. This took me a long time to figure out because you're like, uh, how does this work? Um, but it's very, very important and very, very powerful. And one of the things I love about the language. This is another one. This is from Nathan's article. So I have a struct called part, which is a name description and it needs a spare. I define a type that is a slice of parts. And then into a bicycle, I can give it parts. And that's how I do it. I don't inherit from bicycle being some form of two-wheeled vehicle or whatnot. I just embed these things. So if I had a car, I could do the same thing with parts. I could say a car might have a, a color or a weight, and I have parts for that thing. And I'm reusing the same struct. And I'm not inheriting like bike and car or some sort of weird vehicle that both share wheels and number of wheels. Um, try this experiment. It's really interesting. Don't write objects. Write structs and functions that operate on the structs. Do not attach methods to your structs yet and see what happens. It's a really interesting experiment. And it, sometimes it doesn't work. Like, it, it fails miserably sometimes. But if you try it, you start to get this idea of, I have objects, but they're kind of just structs with functions on them. Um, we see a lot of this in, our, in, our, in the Cloud Foundry code base, and we're pulling some of it out. Um, embracing the interface. So as Rubyus, we don't get to play with interfaces. You have duct typing, and that's great, but you never define an interface. You never pass interfaces around. You pass these objects around, and you kind of hope they implement at runtime that method. Um, if not, you're kind of screwed. So this was another big one for me. Learning about interfaces. How do interfaces work? How to use them? Um, I need to find Jeremy's article now on when not to use interfaces. Because when I started writing Go, everything was an interface. Like dependency inject all the things. Mock all the things. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. Defining your old types. So Gabriel, I'm going to go and fly in the face of what he just said. I kind of like this aspect of Go. Um, so here... I define two new types of name and age. Name is of type string and age is of type int. I'm just redefining them. Now when I look at my function declarations, I kind of know what these things are. And this is another one of those things that I'm still playing with. Um, it might blow up horribly in my face, but um, again, you try it out. Kick the tires on it. It might work for you. It might work for your team. It might not work for you. And if Gabriel's on your team, he's taking all these out. <laughs> um, this was a big one for us. And this is the one that trips a lot of people up because they come to Go and they're like, Go routine, sweet, concurrency, all of the things. Um, and this will bite you in the butt. One of the reasons is because of the lack of immutability. You're passing these pointers across channels and you're not really giving them up and you forgot that you've not, you're not giving them up. And now you're mutating things on both ends of a channel. Um, these two talks are great. I don't know if there are new ones. These are relatively old. Um, but these are two, this talk, this is the first one by Rob Pike. This is the second one. Really cool. And they have really cool gopher analogies. They have the little guys with the books that bring the books to the middle. Um, watch them. Learn from them. Just study them. Um, and use concurrency sparingly. Because you can go routine all the things, and now you're like, oh, I have no idea what's going on in here. So use concurrency sparingly. Um, this is the biggest one, is screw stuff up. Go out, try things, form your own opinions on the language. Um, Go is pretty opinionated, but also not very opinionated. Um, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have fun. You're going to all, try all the things. Um, this is a great place to do that, the Go Playground. Um, I love this because you can just go. You can share links with things. Um, it's really awesome. I really commend the team on this. This has been, been a great learning thing for me and team members. Um, Effective Go and another amazing document. Uh, like, this is it. Like, here's how the Go team wants to go. And as much as I think Rob Pike is wrong a lot of times, it's just, it's just you're going to hurt yourself. It's just going to be painful. You might as well just follow the idioms of the language. If you don't like the language, go pick another tool. So if you try to fight the language, you're just going to hurt yourself with if any language. If you try to fight Ruby and you try to do threading in Ruby, you're just going to hurt yourself. Um, Read the source code. I think we've kind of beaten this horse. Um, we had a whole great talk on that. So the source code is great. Um, now that it's on GitHub, it's awesome. 
This is another good one. I, you could probably find this guy and ask him some questions. Um, this is 2013. Um, so, it's, again, you're just going to end up reading a lot of stuff and trying out with a lot of stuff. And you, that's what you have to do. You have to experiment with this. Um, so, a little reminder. Learn the vocabulary. Forget your old stuff. Um, don't try to do Ruby's object-oriented programming in Go. It will cause nothing but pain. Um, favor composition over inheritance. Um, this whole experimentation thing of using functions and structs instead of quote-unquote objects. Um, create your own types. Embracing the interface. Um, studying the concurrency models. And then just having fun. Um, there are many others. This is not the exhaustive list to learning Go. Um, the internet is full of great things. There's a ton of good blog posts, and the Go team has done a great job of putting all that stuff on the Golang website. Um, so take a look there. Just Google it. Um, I did get some questions from Twitter that I wanted to answer. Um, so we'll start with those. This is always the fun one to answer. Um, so is Go indeed a good fit for web apps or just APIs? And I'm going to probably upset at least somebody in this room. I think it's horrible for web apps. I think it is very bad for web applications. I hope the Revel author is not in the room nor listening to this talk. If you want to write web apps, use Rails or some sort of dynamic language like that. If you're writing APIs, you should use Go. So Matt Aminetti, the CTO of Splice, has just moved all of his APIs to Go. So he was a Merb contributor. I, think, I don't know if he was on the Rails core team. The guy writes Ruby, like nobody's business. He started out with the Splice architecture. It was Rails on the front end, talking to Go services on the back end. And the Rails architecture had no access to the database. It was simply serving up server-side pages. Recently, I've heard they've gotten rid of the Rails app, and now it's full JavaScript on one end and, and APIs on the back end. So in my opinion, if you're writing APIs, awesome. If you're writing web apps, you know, your mileage is going to vary. Um, performance is the only factor in a cost-benefit analysis. These are always tricky questions to answer. There are so many. The performance is awesome. If you're using Ruby, the performance in Go is light years. Java, I've heard, is faster depending on who you talk to. Um, but if you're using Ruby, especially MRI, you're just not going to find any better performance. The thing for me is the lightweight type system. The type system in Go is not heavy like Java's, and it is, exists unlike Ruby. Um, so for me, that was a big thing in Go. Um, one of the reasons we rewrote the CLI was having one binary to distribute. So I give a talk on the whole rewrite of the CLI. I won't bore you with the details. But the one thing was the reason we did it is we went into a big federal organization. We handed them a Ruby gem, and they're like, you have no internet access. And we're like, oh, Jesus. That's not going to be a good thing. They also told us we were going to be running on Windows. So they took the Ruby gem, they packaged it up with some like warbler magic, and then installed JRuby on the machine and got it to limp along. Um, it was a mess. Um, so for me, the cost-benefit analysis is not only performance, but it's ease of use and a whole bunch of other things. Like Francesc said, it's a tool. You're solving problems, pick the right tool. When all you have is a screwdriver, everything looks like a screw. Um, so do the right thing. 